Boker Tov, good morning. Welcome to the Aliyah today. We're going to be looking at the Haggadah for Pesach today, looking at some insights related to the Haggadah, pivoting a little bit from our discussion from Edzora so that we can spend some time preparing our hearts and mind for the upcoming Seder, uh, which is uh, obviously coming up Monday night this year anyway, which is the 14th of Nisan. So I thought we would, we would look at some insights, discuss the Haggadah uh, in order so that when we come to the Seder, we have, to the, to the degree possible, uh, prepared ourselves uh, for this experience. One of the names uh, of, or one of the ideas, I guess, around the Pesach night, the Pesach Seder, is that it's a night of anticipation. And that uh, we should be anticipating um, the uh, what the events of the Passover, the events of the, of, of the Exodus. Um, a concept in Judaism that is taught is that any of our holidays are not just remembrances. It's not like the other uh, nations of the world where they have a holiday, uh, you know, like like Fourth of July. Uh, the 4th of July here in the United States, uh, we celebrate our Declaration of Independence and Freedom and so forth, They're very patriotic. But it, it commemorates an event that happened a long, long ago. Uh, not so in Judaism. In Judaism, whenever we have a holiday, what is actually happening is that the anointing, the Kedusha of that holiday is intersecting with us at this moment. I like what I read in an introduction to one of the Haggadot that I have, Haggadot that I have, is that a lot of people see history as linear. Uh, but in Judaism, it's not so. It's circular or better expressed, it's like a spiral, meaning that as we go through history, we are spiraling in a circle. And as a result, uh, throughout the year, we intersect with these points of Kedusha, with these points of anointing that happened long ago. So at this time of year, we're intersecting once again with that, that Kedusha of time known as Pesach, whereby freedom, deliverance, uh, anointing, power, supernatural uh, ability and miracles and so forth, that same divine energy exists at this time, just like it did thousands of years ago. And that's a very exciting moment. Same thing for Hanukkah, same thing for Purim, same thing for Shabbat and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and for that matter, Tisha B'Av, and all the other, all the other um, uh, observances that we have, we, we intersect with those. And as a result, <clears throat> we have to uh, prepare ourselves and, and ready ourselves to receive that divine energy when we sit down at the Seder. <clears throat> like, so the Seder is not just an event uh, where, whereby we, we remember something that happened in the past, but rather it is uh, something that we connect with, that we plug into. So today we're going to be looking at some insights from the Haggadah. So for those of you who don't know, one of the oldest publications in Judaism um, even more so than the Siddur, is the Haggadah. Uh, you know, families in Judaism may have um, a, a limited library. Not everybody has a huge library, um, but everybody's going to have a, a Haggadah. Haggadah is, the word Haggadah means literally the, the telling. The telling. The, because the greatest mitzvah of, of the uh, Passover Seder is that we tell the story of the Exodus. So therefore, the name of the booklet that we use is called the Haggadah. Now there's many Haggadot. Uh, they're all they all can uh, they all contain really the same uh, information in, in terms of uh, the ceremony itself. But there are many because there there are there are various insights and so forth. And for many years, I I got to where I collected uh, Haggadot. Um, I have. Uh, I, more than a dozen. Uh, some of them I have are actually um, uh, actually rather old. I kind of am, I'm, 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 I, I don't know. It's, it's a, I, I like to collect antique books whenever I can. Um, I was just uh, going through my library the other day, was, was 
looking at a book that I was showing the Rebbe scene. I have a, a tractate of the Talmud, um, which uh, uh, tractate Zevakim. I have a tractate from the uh, Talmud that, that was printed in 1862, um, and so I have a Haggadah that was printed in um, I forget the year, but it's 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 antique. But anyway, the point is is that I, I there's something very special about the Haggadah because it's almost like saying you know this is this is how it all began. This is how it all started. Of course, the the gospel message is the Exodus message. It's it's uh, you know we've we've been th all through that, but we're going to be talking about the Haggadah today. We're going to try to familiarize familiarize ourselves with uh, certain aspects of it. I have, as I said, over a dozen Haggadot, but I, and I also wrote one for the synagogue. And the reason I wrote one for the shul or or for the for Lapid Judaism, not just the synagogue, but for Lapid Judaism, was because I I, I wanted to. Uh, to try to connect some of these thoughts from the Haggadah directly with insights related to Messiah Yeshua. And I spent a lot of time, I originally wrote this uh, Haggadah back in 2009, and it's been through many, many uh, edits. And last year was a major edit. Uh, I, you know, I could have, I could have, and e even so I still, when I go look at other Haggadot, I think, man, I should, I could add this to that. I could add that to it. Uh, it, I mean, but before you know it, the, the our Haggadah could be you know three hundred pages. Um, but in any case, we'll be looking at that today and looking at some insights and and try to uh, glean what we can. Uh, not just today, but also tomorrow. We're gonna spend the next couple days uh, looking at insights into Pesach. So good morning, Ahava. I hope you're doing great. Uh, oh, by the way, before I continue on with the with the good mornings, I put a uh, comment here in the live chat. Because those of you who are getting rid of your hummets, we have now uh, on our website, as you might find in other uh, Jewish websites, the opportunity to sell your hummets uh, using the rabbi as the agent. Um, now, this is, of course, for intended for hummets that uh, it, it, to get rid of it would cause, you know, a a, a burden. Uh, you have, uh, un, of course, it's only for unused, unopened packages, except with the exception of whiskeys and scotches and and bourbons and things of that nature, um, but this is a way to um, to do that to take care of the hummus that you that you can't consume, that you can't throw away, that you can't give away uh, for some reason. Some people have this issue because some people have livestock, for instance, and they may have big barrels of, of feed or something, or maybe they have um, you know people have large whiskey cabinets or something like that. So anyway, that this is all uh, halakhically uh, kosher. It's uh, all certified by the chief rabbi of Israel and so forth. But anyway, I have that there. You can take advantage of it, but you have to take advantage of it before really, really, if you want to be cautious, uh, really before Monday morning, if you don't do it before Monday morning, then you have whatever you have in your possession, you have to, you have to throw away, give away, whatever. All right. So good morning, Lori. Hope you're doing great. Good morning. First love club. Good morning, Dana. Hope you're doing fantastic. You and Chaz and Alex and everybody. Good morning, Melanie. Good to see you, my dear. Welcome to the Aliyah this morning. Good morning to Nokab. Welcome. Peaches, formerly from Georgia. I hope you're doing great. Marita, good to see you again. You and Patrick, can't wait to see you guys here in person. Shoshana Keith and um, Yaakov Keith, holding down the frontier there in Indian territory. Welcome. Yolanda, good morning to you, ma'am. Yishai and Adey, I can't wait to see you guys. Very much looking forward to that. It's going to be amazing. Brenda Jones, good morning to you. Kim Bement, good morning from, uh, oh, I thought you were going to tell me where, from Mitten Friends. Is Mitten, where's Mitten Friends? Good morning, Chris and Crystal. Hope you're doing great. And uh, Chanel, bonjour. Uh, Nellie Grace, good morning to you. Hope you're doing fantastic. Isaac, good morning, Isaac. Isaac, I think you're in Florida, right? Just curious. I, <clears throat> I think that's true. Uh, good morning, um, Amanda Martinez from West Virginia. Virgin Virginia. We're from West Virginia, <laughs> from West Virginia, if I could speak. Good morning to you, Amanda. Uh, Amanda, Amanda. And good morning, Shmuel. They're watching from uh, middle Missouri. Good to see you, sir. Sergio, hope you and the family are doing great. Kelly Allard, good morning to you, ma'am. Alola, good morning, Lola. It's cold in the UK. I can imagine. Y'all are pretty far north on the uh, global map there. Uh, good morning, Hector, also from West Virginia. 
as well. We have some West Virginia being represented here today, Baruch Hashem. Good morning, Kristal. Good to meet. Good to see you, sir. You and Michelle. Hope you're doing fantastic. And who else do we have? Uh, Lynn Whitaker watching from uh, California. Good to see you. Greg Grant from Kentucky. Good morning to you, sir, and all your family. Hope you're being blessed. And uh, who else do we have? Michelle. Oh, uh, good morning to you, Michelle. Hope life is treating you well and you're being richly blessed. Uh, Katura, good morning, Katura. And uh, Katura is the one who put together that... Um, you know, she did the uh, the mechanical work on the <laughs> on the form. So thank you for doing that. Uh, who else do we have? Milka. Good morning, Milka. Hope you're doing fantastic. Amana. Good morning to you. Blessings. Lantern lights. Good morning. Emmanuel. Pushing back the frontiers of ignorance there on the continent of Africa. Thank you for holding down the front there in Africa. Ami. Good morning to you. Hope Claire is doing great and being blessed. And uh, Hepzibah, good morning to you. And Carol Reynolds, good morning to you as well. Brenda Shepard, uh, just picked up my Pesach and wine and matzah. Yes, exciting things indeed. Uh, I went out yesterday and bought a uh, special bottle of Pesach wine. You know, one of my customs is, and it's just me, whenever I buy, um, whenever a holiday is coming up, whether it be Rosh Hashanah or uh, Pesach, I try to go out and, and try to find what I think may be a special bottle ball of wine, maybe a little bit higher on the price point than I might otherwise have, have purchased, you know, something unique just because uh, when I take that first, uh, my, when Rebbe and I take that first drink of the Kiddush kind of want to, um, you know, pull down some divine energy, maybe a special wine. That's just me. Just a thought out there in case uh, those of you who might uh, think to do the same chase Hansen reporting. Uh, out in the field. Welcome, Chase. Hope you're doing great this morning. You and your brethren and your sistren and your family. Hope you're doing great. Uh, who else do we have? Melissa Hawk. Well, Boker Tove, Melissa Hawk. I am glad to see you and I hope you're doing great. Blessings to you, ma'am. Welcome watching from the great state of Ohio. Good morning, Haniel Yosef. Bonjour, Haniel. Bonjour. Good morning, uh, uh, Mikaia. Mikaia. Mika, yeah, I, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sound like I was on Dances with Wolves there for a moment. Mika, yeah, good morning. Uh, who else do we have? Zake and Yagal, good morning. Christopher, good morning. Justin Steckley, you're in Texas, that's right. You guys are in Texas now, ready. Uh, how exciting, you and the fam, and the, and the, and it, anyway, looking so forward to seeing you guys. Very, very exciting. Baruch Hashem. Um, uh, oh, there's Atara. Good morning, Atara. I hope you and Magan are doing great. Atara, I sent Magan a text yes, uh, a couple days ago about an ale. I was wondering if he saw it. Uh, Anamol. Oh, Johanna. Johanna, there it is. Johanna from Manchester, UK. Manchester United. There you go. Look at all these people from UK. Baruch Hashem. Uh, Nafbet, good morning to you. Yeah, listen, look at all these great people. Anthony Collins, good morning, sir, from New Mexico. Welcome to the program, Anthony. Is this your first time to be on live, Anthony? Just curious. Laura, good morning to you. Michelle, good morning. Um, uh, Atara, where in, in Saginaw can I buy matzah? You know what? Um, I don't know, actually. Maybe the Albertsons. Uh, I think sometimes they have it. Now, the, the Kroger on uh, Bailey Boswell, I haven't even looked. Um, but they they at one time, they had a they had a Pesach uh, display. Um, but, Atara, you'd probably, the closest place, if not in Saginaw, you'd have to drive to um, the Tom Thumb on Hewland Street. And they have a, they have a display there. Uh, so, yeah. As far as I know, Yosef, good morning, Yosef and Thelma Chuck. Good morning. Look at all these people. It's amazing. Good morning, Sarah Merritt, Mrs. Merritt. Good morning. I love saying that. <laughs> oh, look at all these precious people. Anyway. All right. Let's dive into this. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing fantastic. So I mentioned about the spiral. I mentioned about connecting to uh, times, uh, times past. 
And um, pardon my reach here for a moment. I got to reach back and grab something. Sorry. Excuse me. Talks amongst yourselves. All right. Here it is. Um, this is a statement I love. I'm going to repeat this at the Seder. Just give me a fair warning. But this is a beautiful statement from Direct Hashem. Okay. And he says, he's talking about, um, this is, by the way, Dora Hashem comes from Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzado. And he's talking about connecting with these times of the year that, um, uh, that come up like Pesach and so forth. And he says, any achievement that was attained, talking about at that time, any achievement that was attained, any great light that radiated at a certain time, when that time comes around again, the radiance of that light will shine again and the fruits of that achievement will be received. For whoever is there to receive them. And I think that last sentence is uh, critical. That when we come to a time like Passover or any time where we have a special um, uh, we have a special moment in, in, in history that that divine energy, that, that anointing is there to be received, but for only those who are there to receive it. And that's why I say that, <clears throat> that the Pesach Seder uh, is a night of anticipation and we must anticipate what we're going to receive from that from that moment. You in other words, you, you have to come prepared. You have to come prepared mentally, you have to come prepared physically, you have to become prepared spiritually. You have to expect that there is going to be a divine flow of anointing that's coming into your life. Just a quote from our Haggadah, I quoted here from Pesachim 116b. The Tana of the Mishnah further stated, in each and every generation, a person must view himself as though he personally left Egypt, as it is said, and you shall tell your son on that day, saying, it is because of this which Hashem did for me when I came forth out of Egypt, Exodus 13, 8. In every generation, each person must say, this which Hashem did for me, and not this which Hashem did for my forefathers. So again, uh, we have to see ourselves as if we were personally set free from, from Egypt. And this is very exciting because again, once again, this is, we're coming to the Seder, but we're not talking about something that happened to our ancestors, but rather we're talking about what happened to us. And here's what I, what I really want you to get about the, about the Haggadah. The Haggadah, the telling, is your story. It's my story as Jews, as Jews. Now, if you're not Jewish yet, then we invite you to go through conversion and become a Jew we really want you to, to do it. We want you to be like the mixed multitude who joined the Jews, became Jews. You ever notice that after Mount Sinai, the term mixed multitude is never used again? It's it's we're only the children of Israel. Why? Because there weren't any Gentiles anymore after we received the covenant. But anyway, this is our story. And you have to see yourself as if... Um, you were personally set free from, from Egypt. Exodus 12, 13 through 14 says, and the blood shall be for you a token upon the house where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And there shall be no plague be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast to Adonai throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an ordinance forever. You know, Messiah talked about this when he was, when he had the, the last supper, which was of course a Pesach Seder. Messiah said, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So this is why an important element of our Pesach Seder is to remember the atoning work of the Mashiach 
and to bring that Kedusha into this time period as well. Because just like we're talking about with the events of the Exodus and encountering that, uh, that Kedusha, we're also talking about the Kedusha of the macro at atoning work of the Mashiach, the suffering Messiah, the Mashiach ben Yosef, who came to turn back uh, the, the, uh, the sin of the Garden of Eden, the sin of the Golden Calf, so again, this is a time, a night where we, we impact uh, a, a complete reversal of the curse. We reverse the curse for Klal Israel, for all of Israel. We're coming into that, that contact as well. So the uh, Seder night is called the Leil HaSeder, which is called the Seder night. The most majestic of nights, it's, it's called. The most memorial, uh, mem memorable of all nights. The night that is different from all other nights. The table is set with the finest china, crystal, and silver. The aroma of, of familiar Pesach cuisine saturates the air. The elements of the Seder are arranged on a special plate ready for the family to experience the Pesach Seder uh, in order to internalize its lessons once again to realize that once we were slaves, but now we were free. So the... the um, the festival of Pesach is known as the festival of freedom. Now, this is very important, right? Because we talk about the Torah a lot, obviously. Um, and we also have talked about the Torah being a, a, um, uh, a document of freedom as opposed to a document of burden. Yes, Greg, it's online. Just go to... Uh, to uh, the lapidjudaism.org, lapidjudaism.org, and you can find it in the document section, and you can uh, you can uh, download it there. Um, so, you know, most people look at the law of Moses and they see it as a burden. It's a shackle. It's a confinement. But actually, it's the exact opposite. That's a lie of the Satan, by the way. The law of Moses, the Torah, is freedom. In fact, if you look at it, we were in Egypt. The word Egypt, Mitzrayim, literally means confinement, restriction, constriction. In Mitzrayim, we didn't have the law of Moses, and yet we were confined. We were restricted. We were constricted. Now, we, we were set free from Egypt in order that we could go to Mount Sinai and so that we could receive the law of Moses. That's why Pesach is a festival of freedom. And did you know, by the way, that, you know, this is coming, Passover is coming up, but the conclusion of Passover is actually Shavuot. <clears throat> so in reality, although we don't practice this in, in a literal sense, but realistically speaking, from the, from Passover until Shavuot is really one big long holiday. Now again, we don't have we don't celebrate it like that in the literal sense, but the fact of the matter is that Shavuot is the um the the climax of Pesach. It's the purpose of Pesach. That's why Pesach is called the festival of freedom because we are going to freedom headed towards headed towards what? headed towards Mount Sinai in order to receive the Torah. Good morning, Macy from Toronto. Glad you're here. So uh, this is also referred to as the Hag Ha'amunah. Hag, by the way, is a Hebrew word for festival. Hag, Hag Ha'amunah. The story of the Exodus is the most important story in scripture. And boy, isn't that true. Good morning, Eliezer. And good morning, Anthony, again. <laughs> The story of the Exodus is the most important story in Scripture, even greater than the revelation of Yeshua as the Messiah. Yes, because if it wasn't for the Exodus, we couldn't have the Messiah. So this is the festival of freedom. It's the festival of faith. It's, it's so important. Now, now, part of the Seder, we have, um, of course, the Seder plate. And, and uh, I have to say, you know, Hashem blessed... Lapid Judaism with a beautiful, beautiful Seder. Can, can I just tell you this story really quick? Seder plate. I'm going to tell you this story really quickly. 
Okay, just I'm not going to belabor this, but there was a wonderful Judaica store here in Dallas, uh, and I had become friends with the owner, and was we shopped there for many years. It was a big, beautiful place. The owner of the store, Rabbi Bloomstell, and I um, actually became good friends. And unfortunately, uh, it went out of business. And boy, that was a heartbreak. Um, but as it turns out, Hashem made it so that we ended up acquiring uh, most of the stuff in that store because they had a they had an auction, and you know we just bid on the auction, and lo and behold, we we won a lot of stuff. And so, anyway, well, we get there, and I uh, had to go. I literally had to go rent a U-Haul truck. That's how much it was. I mean, literally. And so we did that. It's been a long time ago. And we went there and um, the people that were running the auction were not Jewish. They they had no idea anything about Judaism. And um, we, you know, they got to talking to us, found out who we were. And they, you know, we, we were spent, we spent three days in that store going in and out, taking stuff out. That's how long it took. And so um, in the process, we got to know them and so forth. And towards the end of getting everything out, um, the people said, you know, um, uh, there might be some stuff upstairs that we were just going to throw away that we didn't really know what it was or what to do with it. Uh, we didn't think it was like auction worthy or whatever. Um, so if you want to, you can go upstairs in the storage area and uh, the office area upstairs and, and see what, what's up there. If you'd like to, to, to get it or not. And we were like, well, well, yeah. So we went up there and, uh, they had put into a bag ready to be thrown in the trash. You're not going to believe this. Um, it, and no fault of their own. They, they, they were good people. They just didn't know what they didn't know. But they had put in there um, dozens of parchments for the mezuzah. Uh, in fact, our synagogue today, um, every door that has a mezuzah on it at the synagogue, uh, one of those parchments that we redeemed from that bag um, are in those mezuzah today all over the synagogue. And the other thing that was one of the, one of the other, there was many things up there, but one of the other things that was sitting up there was this magnificent, glorious, beautiful, unbelievably beautiful <sighs> Arizal um, Seder plate, just ready to be cast into the dumpster. And of course, we gladly took it. And that's beautiful, gorgeous, magnificent, be most beautiful Seder plate I've ever seen in my life. We that became the Lapid Judaism Seder plate for our Seders. It was absolutely magnificent. I'm so thankful to Hashem. Um, but yeah, that's the story of how we acquired our Seder plate. Just I, I don't know, maybe that means something to you, but anyway, it's great. So on the Seder plate, there are certain elements. Okay. So let's um let's look at these elements really quickly, okay. So first we have the shank bone, the zoroa, the, which is the bone of a lamb that has a little bit of meat on it. And this, of course, represents the Pesach lamb. Zoroa literally means arm. And as far as the sephrot, it's related to chesed. So this is very interesting. So the lamb, mean, the, the word zoroa literally means arm, like the saving arm of the Lord. and it is related with kindness, hesed. Now, we do not have a lamb at the Pesach Seder, okay? And the reason that we do not, and most Jews don't, I mean, there are exceptions to the rule, but but really most Jewish Seders, uh, legit Jewish Seders are not going to have uh, uh, lamb at the Pesach Seder. Now, some people uh, in the past who aren't Jewish have said what well, isn't that a violation of the of the torah because the torah says you're to eat lamb and the answer to that question is no it's not that that is not what the torah says the torah says you're supposed to have the sacrifice the lamb the the um corbin pesach and it has to be a sacrifice uh, since we're not allowed to sacrifice because we don't have a temple therefore we don't have lamb of the pesach and and frankly if you do have lamb of the pesach and you're saying suggesting you're to quote Zake and Rayford, you're inferring, implying, insinuating that this lamb is, is being eaten in fulfillment of this, the Torah, then you are in fact sinning because you're declaring that meat a Corbin when it, it, it can't be, you see what I'm saying? So we don't eat lamb. Now you can have lamb during Passover, you know, but just not at the Seder. Okay. 
Um, so Zoroa, shank bone, we have that's yeah, that's on the Seder plate to represent. The Seder plate is all about elements of of representation. You have an egg about Zia, a roasted or boiled egg. Now, a lot of people see the egg because most people who come to the Seder and they aren't Jewish, most of them, not all, but most of them are Christian. Excuse me. You know, allergies this morning. Sorry. Um, they're, they're come from a Christian background. They see the egg and immediately they freak out because they're thinking, oh no, we've got paganism and Judaism too. They have been corrupted with the egg thing, the bunny thing, just like Christianity. And ladies and gentlemen, that's not it at all. Okay. The egg, um, the hard boiled egg represents an offering called the Corban Hagiga or the festival sacrifice from Pesachim 114b. An Aramaic egg means pray or please, and it's associated with a sephra gevora, a strength. Now, this is also very important because we just talked about the lamb shank and what it, um, and what it means. You know, Philip Gray said sephardim do eat the lamb. Yeah, that's true in some cases, Philip. It's very problematic, though. It's very problematic because um, if you read the halakha about that, the, the Sephardic halakha, you'll see that you have to, you can eat it, They, to, in their opinion. However, you have to really, really focus and, and even make a declaration in some cases that this is not the Corbin Pesach. This is not representing the Passover um, lamb of Torah. They make a big deal about that, Philip. If you've ever actually studied the halacha of the, the Sephardic Seder, why? Because it's a big issue. So my position and the position of many rabbis is why would you even want to try to walk that line? Because to eat, because you, see, here's the problem, Philip. You might be sitting there at the Seder going, oh, I'm eating the lamb, and this is kind of like in fulfillment of the, of, the, of the Torah. The minute you think something like that, you've committed a big sin. And that's why it's so dangerous. That's why it's just that's why it's just avoided. So going back to the egg, so the shank bone, the zoroa, represents the lamb, right? But what people don't know is that there's actually there were actually two lambs at Pesach, and both of them were festive lambs. The Pesach lamb was actually dessert. Dessert at the uh dessert at the at the Pesach Seder of antiquity was not angel food cake, it was actually the lamb. The lamb was dessert. The meal was a meal of the Hagiga lamb. Now, why is this important? Why am I spending some time on this? Because um, two lambs, two messiahs, two lambs, two Akedas. There was the Akedah of Isaac and the Akedah of Yeshua. There was the Akedah of, or excuse me, there was the uh, Messiah bin Yosef and the Messiah bin David. You're not even allowed to eat the Passover lamb until you've completely satiated yourself with the Hagiga lamb. In other words, you have to be full. This is why we eat of the Afikoman at the very last of the Seder after everything has been eaten and it's the last thing you're supposed to eat. So you can't even eat of Yeshua symbolically here unless you have been filled up on everything else of the Torah. Does that make sense to you? Now, we also have on the Seder plate, bitter herbs, which is mawar. This is the grated horseradish. It doesn't have to be horseradish. There's a lot of people use horseradish. It's the most common thing, but there are other things you can use. Uh, I believe sometimes people use onions and things like that. But in our case, we always use horseradish. This speaks of the bitterness of bondage, and it is associated with teferit, beauty or mercy. And of course, uh, it's always great to see people who and when they eat the horseradish it's always a fun fun time at the seder because you know it's it's rather harsh we also have on the seder plate the haroseth which is a thick paste of ground apples and fruits and wines and cinnamon sometimes including nuts this corresponds to the mortar with which we made bricks in egypt and it's associated with the uh, sephora of netzak or victory also on the on, on the Seder plate, we have the carpus, which is uh, celery, or c can be celery or parsley. We always use parsley. 
uh, could be radish or even a boiled potato. So the carp is, can, can be a, ho, a, a lot of things, but we typically use parsley as do most people. And these represent springtime and rebirth, and it's related to the sephot of hold, the glory, of humility. The, the reason we also like to use um, uh, uh, parsley as well is because uh, it, it seems to resemble hyssop. And so that's why we use that as well. Um, another uh, element on the Seder plate is the hareset, uh, hazeret, excuse me which is the Roman lettuce, uh, which symbolizes bitterness and harsh, harshness of slavery. This is related to yesod, foundation, attachment. And then, of course, finally, the Seder plate uh, includes, not necessarily, it's usually under the Seder plate. Um, uh, that's the typical way of, of displaying the matzah. But we have the matzah, the special unleavened bread used for the Pesach Seder. The word unleavened in Hebrew is chametz which is a substance that puffs up bread. People think that chametz means sin. It's not sin, but the chametz represents the root of sin, which is haughtiness or arrogance. Uh, I know better than you or whatever, God, so I'm not going to do um, do anything uh, you, that you say. And so matzah, of course, represents ultimately um, ultimately the... Uh, uh, the Mashiach, right? We even know about the, the, the matzah being striped and pierced and so forth uh, and the symbolism that we could de derive from that. Now, <clears throat> um, moving on here in the time we have left, I just wanted to point something out is that, uh, let me move here to the lighting the candles. We have at the Seder time, um, and I'm just going to close with this. I'm going, to, I'm going to finish with this, and we'll come back tomorrow and talk about the simanim and the steps of the Seder and what they represent and why we take them. But let me just say this as we, um, as we come to the conclusion of today's uh, broadcast. The, the Seder night is a night where we're supposed to relax. And I wanted to say this, by the way, before I forget. Sunday particularly, this particular Sunday, is going to be a very busy day. We're going to be setting up for the Seder. It's going to be running around and all that. Same thing for your house as well. Don't allow the Satan to steal your joy in the busyness. The busyness is supposed to be a blessing. We're supposed to have joy. In other words, everything that we do is supposed to be done with a festive zeal. So don't allow being busy or perhaps being tired or whatever to frustrate you. So let's all work on that together, right? But when we come to the Seder, we're supposed to be like royalty. We're supposed to lean and to the left and so forth and relax at the Seder. We're, uh, and so as a result, it says, on, on this is from Kitzur Shalach, on the night of Pesach, a man and his wife should conduct themselves as a king and a queen, and their children should be treated like princes and princesses. The Midrash teaches that Israel lost a very special status in the wilderness. HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to them, you caused your own downfall. In the past, prior to your sin, you were served through divine spirit. Now, after the sin of the golden calf, you will only be served through an angel. Midrash Rabbah Shemot 32.1. However, through the redemption of Messiah Yeshua, we have had this special status restored. So as a result of us being royalty, and this is something else that we shouldn't forget, as a result of us being royalty at the Seder, it's customary that no one at the Seder pours their own cup, but their cup, we're talking about the cups of wine, should be poured by someone else to symbolize the royalty of each participant and that they have, as it were, a servant. And so we, through this, as Lapid Jews, we also remember the words of our King Messiah who taught us that we should serve as opposed to be to being served. So just remember at the Seder that you never pour your own glass. Somebody should pour your cup for you. End of our Aliyah today. We'll come back tomorrow and talk about the 15 Simanim of the, the Pesach. We'll go through the steps of the Pesach and explain why we take these steps and what they represent. Thank you so much for being here. All of you who are online, it's a blessing to have each and every one of you with us. May you have a blessed and wonderful and amazing day. 
There will be a Musar today at noon, so look forward to that. And uh, it's going to be amazing. I think there's going to be a reading tonight with Zake and Yagal. Zake, I'm not sure. Uh, with all the busyness, you may not be doing that. But if you are, let us know. Um, and we will look forward to that. So blessings to you. Shalom Aleichem to you. Please like this program. Share with all of your friends. If you have any questions about Pesach, please reach out to us and, and ask. We'll be happy, happy, happy to answer you. Have a blessed, wonderful, amazing day. Shalom Aleichem.